Hello, everybody. How's everybody enjoying the conference? This is my very first spring one. Um, today I'm, uh, well, actually, my name is, is Dario Shamiri, but you can call me Dario. I'm a product of a mixed background, Italian and Iranian. So um, either way works. Um, and uh, my Twitter handler is up there. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a project that we've been working on specifically to tackle the access control requirements of RESTful services that uh, GE deploys into its Cloud Foundry deployment. But um, we've open sourced this project because we believe that it's a problem that other people might want to solve as well or might be looking for a, a solution into. It's called ACS. Let's see. All right. It's called ACS. It's not very imaginative, um, but it stands for Access Control Services, so at least it's very explicit about what it does. Um, and it's basically, it basically exists to provide for fine-grained access control for RESTful APIs. Uh, it's available on GitHub. There's a standard sort of master develop branch. Um, there's also a demo branch with some of the stuff that I'm going to show today. It's a Apache V2. Um, it's a Spring Boot project. It actually uses Spring heavily underneath the hood, and a lot of the extensions that we designed to integrate with it are Spring-based as well. So why did we build this thing? Why do it? Um, well, to begin with, uh, we use OAuth heavily, but one of the things that we found about OAuth is that the privilege model within OAuth itself is pretty coarse-grained. When you think about what OAuth scopes are, they essentially amount to describing privileges as a giant flat list. And that doesn't necessarily work for a lot of the use cases that we have in the industrial world. Secondly, scopes are usually tightly coupled to the access tokens that are issued. And one simple way of explaining what that means is that a lot of times you're issued an access token when you log in, and if a privilege changes, essentially to sort of refresh the active privileges of the user, you have to sort of get them to sort of log out and log back in. Thirdly, OAuth isn't really the type of service that's necessarily tuned for constant polling of whether or not an access control, op an access control operation is allowed or not. Um, you know, if you're lucky, your OAuth server might be in data center, but um, as often as the case, it's not. When we were building the service, we had some guiding architectural concerns. We wanted to build something that was consistent and reusable, and we wanted it to be decoupled from the application. A lot of times, really fine-grained access control is something that's built within the application, and then it becomes a develop an application developer concern, whereas the actual policies around what you're allowed to access through an application might change and might actually be governed by different people. We wanted a consistent way to define these access control policies so that the people who are in charge of governance, in essence, could have a uniform way of describing what, that, what the policies would be across all the different RESTful services that they, that they would manage. And we wanted to also have a, a shareable and distributed privilege store that sort of took the old privilege stores into the world of cloud. And by old privileged stores, I mean LDAP stores and SQL databases, which abound when people are looking for user privileges. So here's the example use case. Um, and I'm just going to read this sentence. Essentially, if you can imagine a user that's an analyst, in this case Tom, and all associated privileges, when he's basically going to be an analyst, but only when he's operating on a specific site. In other words, his actual role will change depending upon the resource that he's acting upon. In some situations, he might be an analyst, and in other situations, he might not. And that's a di very difficult problem to model with the existing tool sets. And this is just one of the use cases. There are some other ones out there. We basically need an access control model that can flexibly model this kind of stuff. So what are the components of ACS? Well, it's fundamentally an attribute-based access control system. Um, I'll get to, to what attributes are in a second, just really quickly. But essentially, it's an attribute store. 
It's an attribute store not just for the users, but also the resources that the users are operating on. It's a policy store, meaning this is where your actual access control policy lives. And finally, it's the actual engine that will perform policy evaluation. So let's talk about attributes really quickly. Does any, is everyone familiar with attribute-based access control and, and what it means in essence? I see two or three heads nodding. Um, but essentially an attribute is just a key value pair. Uh, it's asserted by a trusted entity, meaning someone that you trust. And it's useful for making authorization decisions. That's, that's what I, how I would define an attribute in the simplest way possible. And here's an example of what that looks like visually. So in this case, we have a subject, he has a unique identifier, and then he has a set of attributes that essentially define, in essence, information about the user that's pertinent to making uh, access control decisions, such as he is an analyst and he belongs to the researchers group within the organization. Here's an example of attributes applied to a resource. In this case, we have some fictitious thing that lives in the real world. It's an asset. Um, and it has a unique ID, which is represented, in essence, by its URI. And it has some attributes associated with it, such as the site that it's located at and that it also belongs to the researchers group. So how do we use these assets and to essentially evaluate whether or not a particular request is allowed or whether it's permitted or whether it would be denied? Basically, the client will send a request for authorization to ACS. The request will essentially boil down to three main things. Can this particular subject perform a specific action on this specific resource? ACS will perform the attribute discovery for you, and then it will do a policy evaluation on those attributes given the action that the user subject is trying to perform. The client will ultimately receive an authorization decision, as well as any attributes that were discovered by ACS so that it could use them for whatever other purposes it might have. So just to look at that a little bit visually, the internals of ACS in this slide are a little bit black boxed, but essentially, as you can see, the request is basically just trying to determine whether or not Tom can perform a get on this specific URI. And the response will essentially contain a permit or deny. And the discovered attributes will tell the client things that it didn't know about the user and the resource, such as that he's an analyst, he belongs to the researchers group, and the site of the asset. Delving a little deeper into the internals of ACS, you can see that there's an attribute discovery phase where it essentially uses these unique identifiers of users and resources to obtain as much information as it possibly can about these entities. And then there's a policy that will have conditions on it that are essentially built to be somewhat functional in the way they describe whether or not the user is allowed to perform this action. Essentially, if the subject and the resource have the same group, then permit So implementing traditional role-based access control with ACS is pretty straightforward. You essentially will create top-level subjects which define the attributes for the roles in the groups, meaning if you're in a specific role, what do you specifically maybe have access to or what are some defining characteristics of that role? And then you'll also create lower-level subjects which represent users, and those users will, inher will essentially inherit from those parent um, subjects. In other words, I'm describing a hierarchy. At the, at the top you can imagine, in fact, why don't I just go to the visual slide. At the top you can imagine entities which, just, which essentially represent organizations, groups, roles, and then you have users which are essentially inheriting from those subjects. And the effect of that is that the user essentially inherits the attributes associated with those various subjects. Is that pretty clear? You can do the same thing with resources. In this case, I have a specific resource. It has its own specific attribute that maybe says, hey, this is a specific type of report. Um,
but it's also inheriting attributes from the site where it's located at and maybe a group that it belongs to. Question? Quick question, sure. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. So now I'll get to the, to the um, use case that I presented initially. Um, yeah, sure. If there are computing attributes or, you know, in multiple uh, subjects and if they're in there, then how does it? Uh, sure. The question was, what do you do if there's conflicting attributes? Well, attributes are essentially unique by their issuer, their uh, key and their value. So when you, pr when you create and you start to create a collection of attributes, it's basically a set. So as long as, if, if, if there's, in other words, you can have multiple roles as long as the value associated with that role is different, okay? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So if you were to see a conflicting role, nothing would happen. It was essentially, it's kind of like an in-place update. So the example I was talking about before um, is how do you have a, a subject where the role that it actually belongs to is dynamic? In other words, in some situations, the subject might be, might have this role and the associated privileges. In other situations, it might not. So what you can do with ACS is you can specify that a child subject conditionally inherits the attributes of a parent subject depending upon the attributes of the resource it's trying to access. This is what this looks like, essentially. We have this subject attribute hierarchy here on the left-hand side, where we can see that the user is inheriting all these attributes from parent subjects. And you can see that there's this condition on this inheritance right here in the center. As long as the user is operating on a resource that has the site San Ramon attribute, it will inherit the analyst and asset performance roles. In this situation, if we look at the resource, it does have that attribute. Therefore, the user is inheriting those attributes, and at the time of policy evaluation, it'll be easy to determine that they are, in fact, an analyst. What happens if the site attribute of the resource changes. Pretty simple, the user no longer inherits that attribute. And therefore, the same exact policy will determine that this user is not allowed to perform this action. It's not an actual property of the policy, it's a property of the way that the subject inherits its attributes. So this is our technology stack. Basically, it's your standard sort of block diagram about what we use here. Um, if, you, if we go back to this and, and, we, just, and we take a look at all this stuff, it, you kind of get the sense that these kind of hierarchies would probably make sense in a graph database. And that's exactly what we do. So we're built on top of, um, well, the attribute store is built on, on top of Apache Tinkerpop and TitanDB. And we use the graph capabilities of, of, of Gremlin and so forth to essentially perform the traversals that we need to do to find the attributes that apply in specific situations. Um, we still use uh, a lot of Spring data. It's a Spring Boot application at its heart. Uh, it, it, it's a RESTful API, and, and we build it using Spring MVC. So there's a lot of Spring um, in this. And we also bring uh, build client integration into Spring Security for this as an extension to Spring Security. One thing that's not shown here is that we have a mechanism to cache a lot of the um, requests that we make for authorization. Um, and that essentially leverages Redis to do that. As I was saying before, like, with OAuth, the, the, the privileges are essentially tied to the scope of the token. The way we do our caching, the minute you make a change in a subject or a resource's privilege, that essentially invalidates the cache. And so all the effects of changing privileges are immediate. Um, let's see. I think I have enough time for a demo, right? 
Sure. How you maintain it? You have to have some application to maintain policy, user attribute, and so on, so on, so on. That's correct. So there, there, there is. So the question is, how do you maintain? How do you manage, presumably attributes and 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 policies? And yes, you do have to have applications that do that. One of the things we're looking at um, within GE is to build also dashboards and further tools that help you do that. But right now, you you essentially have to be able to talk to the RESTful API and 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 manage that. Sure. Very similar functionality already exists in uh, Oracle uh, Infectment Server. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with that product. I'm, these concepts, I'm, I'm sure that other people have run into these problems and tried to solve them. It's great to know that somebody else is. If you give me some information about that, I'd like to look into it. Um, I could do some more questions or we could do a demo. It's, it's, uh, it's up to you guys at this point. <clears throat> yeah. What about you know performance limitations and what about any other limitations of your system? For example, so how many units can it handle? So I would say that with all the performance testing that we've done, um, on average the penalty you'll pay for a call to ACS is around twenty milliseconds. So, you know, you'll have to take that into consideration. It might be appropriate for some use cases, it might not. Well, y yes, there are. Um, and, and right now, I think the exact number of users that we use to do our performance testing is in the thousands, I think. But I don't have the exact numbers. Is this solution open source? Yes, it is. Um, I, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, but I'll, I'll mention it again. Um, you can find it on, on GitHub. It's uh, GitHub slash predict slash ACS. Um, I believe it's in the slide deck, but if it's not, Apologize, um, and it's uh, Apache uh, licensed, Apache V2. Uh, can can we do inheritance in terms of roles? Uh, what kind of credentials they can provide? Sure. The question was, can we do inheritance in terms of roles? Yes, you can. Roles can inherit from other roles. Um, you can make your attribute model as complex as you want. Just keep in 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 mind that. Underneath the hood, it's doing graph traversals. And even though it's eventually caching the decision, that you might pay a little bit of a penalty when you make that first uh, request. So this is going to replace that into management? No, this is not a replacement for identity management. This is a mechanism to enforce access control at your RESTful layer. It's essentially a microservice for all the logic that you would normally build in your application. Um, let's put it in a microservice and let's do it there and let's have somebody else you know, worry about that so the app developer can just focus a little bit more on, on, on the business logic that they're implementing. They might still have to do some access control related stuff, but this takes a lot of that off their plate. Um, okay, so the demo is actually available online. There's a there's a demo branch. This is really sad. Um, I am connected, aren't I not? Yeah, slow, but all right, let's see. Um, so right now, actually, is anyone from the UAA team here? Do they want to help me? Uh, it might take too long if I do a clean. Um, this was running earlier. I, I basically have to run UAA because, all right, so actually it's worth mentioning that, yeah, you know, I can do this a thousand times. It's not going to work. Um, Saying, oh, hold on a second. Let's see if that'll do it. All 
All right, I think we might be in business. It, yeah, all right. Um, so while it's loading up, let me explain that a little bit. So ACS is itself a RESTful API. You make calls to create resources, subjects, assign attributes, upload policies, so forth and so on. And as such, it needs to be itself access controlled. So you have a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem there. The way we do that is we use OAuth. We, love, we still love OAuth. Let no one say that we don't love OAuth. Um, and we use UAA to do that, to be our OAuth authorization server, because it's a really cool project and it's open source. And you know, shout out to all the UAA folk out there. Um, so yeah, I, this is unfortunate that it's downloading all these dependencies. It, it might take some time to load. Um, in the meanwhile, I guess, um, if anyone has any questions, I can keep. So the integration with um, CF, is that through uh, broad services, or is, that using, or is that each service can call the authorization? OK, yeah, excellent question. So basically, each service can call the authorization service, but now that we've finally gotten to having a Cloud Foundry deployment that has support for route services, we're actively looking into building support for route services to do that. So ideally, in, in the long-term vision, which, was, which we kind of like started to maybe see the edges of uh, years ago, we said, this would be really great if it was just part of the infrastructure. If someone could just say, hey, I had this RESTful endpoint, and we're a RESTful shop, and I just want to be able to access control this based on some attribute store that I have someplace else. So as part of the predicts deployment, uh, this is already included? Yes, it is. It's actually a service on the predicts marketplace, which you can sign up for and you can start using. Um, and in the slide deck, there's actually a link to our documentation. That's, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't plug it more than that, other than to say that if you go to our documentation, you'll go to the predicts IO site, and, and you'll see what's, what's up. Um, cargo run local. Other questions while we wait for this? <laughs> Hopefully we don't run out of time. I tell you what, while, while I'm here, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the demo document. So the demo itself, you can, you can see the full script of the demo online on the demo branch. Um, and this document over here goes step by step. And is anyone familiar with literate programming? This is actually an Emacs org mode document. So you can actually download this, set it up in Emacs, and execute every single little bit of code over here and get the demo to work on your own just by running UAA and ACS locally. Um, it, for anyone who, who's, who likes Emacs or has a love affair with Emacs like I do, like, you know, shout out to you guys. Um, but essentially, the, the, specific, um, the specific demo that I'm going to do is revolves around all those uh, hierarchical attributes with, with, uh, with dynamic role examples. So I'm going to go through the whole process of you know, creating a subject and, uh, and creating a resource that has um, hierarchical attributes and, and then showing how, how you can build a policy around that. So <clears throat> yes, OK. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a client that I can use to authenticate with ACS. Um, so I'm doing this post over here, and, and you can see that I'm getting back the last modified date. Um, and essentially, this is the client that I'm going to use. It has some scopes over here that I'm using essentially to be able to authenticate with ACS to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm allowed to do this, I'm allowed to do that. You can see you can read and write attributes, policies, and, and a couple other things. Um, ACS itself is a multi-tenant service. Let me just see. I need to get it going. As I was saying, it's a multi-tenant service. So the first thing that you would have to do in order to use ACS is to actually create a tenancy within ACS. So that involves obviously getting an access token in order to perform that, parsing the access token, 
and then this is the call that you, you'll basically make. Right? It's pretty simple. Um, the names are sort of unimaginative, but basically, you know, each each tenancy has a human readable name, a description, and a subdomain that it could be potentially mapped to. So, assuming this guy's up and running, looks like it is. So when I when I execute this little bit of code, I go out and I do all those things, and then I finally get a 201 created, and you can see the timestamp on that is at least today. And I think the GMT is accurate. Um, so once I've created the zone, I can actually start performing actions on ACS. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a subject which represents the analyst role. Um, and in terms of attributes, it's pretty scarce. It just has an attribute that basically says, like, whoever is a member of this role is an analyst. Um, so we have a subject identifier. We have a single attribute here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and create that. And you can see the timestamps at least updating here if, if you don't believe what I'm doing. Um, so now that I've created that, I'm going to create a user. And what I'm doing with this user is I'm basically saying, all right, here's the subject identifier of the user. And this user has some parents wh from which it's inheriting attributes. In this case, it's inheriting attributes from the analyst role. And it's doing it conditionally. So in essence, I'm, I'm scoping this inheritance. I'm saying, when he happens to be operating on a resource that has this particular attribute, where the site is San Ramon, he will inherit those attributes from its parent. Otherwise, he will not. OK, cool. So we know that was updated. So now we're going to create a uh, resource that represents a site. And this is pretty simple again. It's just very simple. We have a San Ramon site, and it has one attribute that says, well, this site is the San Ramon site. And yep, that timestamp looks accurate. <clears throat> So now I'm going to take engine number nine, which is some asset in the field, and I'm going to say engine number nine is located at the San Ramon site. That's not actually true, but for the purpose of this fictitious demo, we can say that. And timestamp gets accurated. And then finally, I'm going to create a resource that does not, is not located in, in the San Ramon site. Engine 11 is not located there. Um, so here's my policy. And you guys might, might be wondering, well, what does the policy look like? Here's what it looks like. It's, it's JSON. And, um, and you can see that the conditions are not JSON. And this is one of the things that when we started to work with other technologies like ZACMOL that we found really annoying is that in ZACMOL, you write code in XML, which is nuts, right? And the way you get around that is that you buy some really expensive tooling from some companies that make some, well, admittedly really good tooling, and you essentially write with code, and then that code gets translated to ZACMOL. Well, we just decided to cut out the middleman and say, we're just gonna stick the code in there. So there's actually, um, without going into too much detail, that's actually Groovy, right? If you ever wondered, like, what other cool things can you do with Groovy? or what, is its time over or something? This is one of the things. So we have a very specific Groovy compiler um, that does static typing and so forth, and we whitelist everything that you can do with it. And so it's a very, very small set of things that you can do, but we have created essentially a, a DSL of sorts for saying, like, these are some conditions based on attributes. So I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to really quickly just post that policy. Let's make sure that it was created. Yes, it was. And here's the request for authorization. So the very first request for authorization is, can Tom get engine number nine? And if I execute this, because engine number nine is located in the San Ramon site, I'll actually get a whole set of attributes associated with engine number nine and Tom and an effective permit. Whereas if I execute this post, can Tom get engine number 11?
you'll see that he gets it denied. And furthermore, you'll see that there are no resource attributes resolved for the subject because he is not an analyst in this context. Did that kind of make sense? I hope it did. Yeah. Inheritance. Uh, so, uh, parent can be, should be user or it can be group or whatever. How you organize inheritance? Okay, the question is how do you organize inheritance? And here's the cool thing any way you want, any way that's specific to the access control model you're trying to create. We're building tools so that you can create more complex access control models in a manageable way. We're not telling you necessarily how to do it. If you want nested role-based access control, you can do that. If you want this sort of, sort of dynamic inheritance, you can do that. It's really up to you. And I think I'm out of time. Is that correct? So if you guys want, I'll, I'll hang out in the hallway and if you have other questions. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it.